So welcome, Jim. Oh, sorry. Welcome, Mr. Jim Given from the Seafarers International Union of Canada. And I'll ask you to uh, give us your name and the capacity in which you will appear today, please. Thank you, Senator. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. My name is James Given. I'm the president of the Seafarers International Union of Canada and the chair of the ITF Cabotage Task Force. Tremendous. So, Jim, you and I have had the pleasure of having many conversations over a uh, cordial and talking about Canadian values and Australian values, so I'm going to uh, give you the option to uh, do an opening statement because you're one of those nations that is a success story recently through your own hard work. Thank you. I would uh, love to give a statement and I miss throwing snowballs around up in the Canadian <laughs> winter with you. The reason for our appearance before you today is to dis discuss the importance of retaining and reinvigorating a domestic maritime shipping industry. I'll be speaking directly to some of the positive outcomes that have been achieved elsewhere in the globe when cabotage regulations relating to the employment of national seafarers operating vessels under the national flag are strengthened rather than diminished. In practice, maritime cabotage means the movement of any goods or passengers between two or more points in the same country. Cabotage laws dictate that any such movement is reserved for vessels owned, registered and operated in that country, employing a workforce of domestic seafarers. There are many variations to cabotage law. In 2015, the SIU of Canada embarked on a mission to ensure that stronger Canadian cabotage laws were put in place by the Government of Canada to ensure greater job security and stricter standards to benefit Canadian and permanent resident seafarers. In Canada, cabotage is enforced under the Coasting Trade Act, under which a foreign flagship may only obtain a temporary license to engage in cabotage in Canadian waters if there is no suitable Canadian vessel to do the job. If no Canadian vessel is available, a special coasting trade waiver is issued by the Canadian Transportation Agency. At the same time, any foreign vessel brought into cabotage must then apply for work permits for foreign crew members through the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. In 2015 and 2016, the SIU of Canada challenged the Government of Canada for the issuance of work permits to 55 foreign nationals on three foreign vessels, which resulted in the Government of Canada admitting that it had improperly issued these work permits to foreign crew members. Mm. A settlement agreement was reached which resulted in the Government developing a special measures policy for the maritime sector, which ensures that any foreign vessel operator seeking to employ temporary foreign workers must first obtain a letter of concurrence from the SIU on behalf of all Canadian maritime unions, stating that there are not qualified Canadian citizens or permanent residents who are available to work on the foreign vessel in question. This collaboration between government and labour allows unions and workers to have a fair say in this critically important process. And since its implementation, we have seen over 700 new jobs being offered to Canadian and permanent resident seafarers prior to any sea foreign seafarer applying to get a permit. For background, the Temporary Foreign Worker Program can only be used by employers to address their labour needs on a limited basis when qualified Canadians or permanent residents are not available. This policy ensures that Canadian seafarers are prioritised above all, while still allowing companies to have options in the labour market if we are in short supply. This policy also ens ensures greater protection for foreign seafarers coming into Canada. As any foreign seafarer who remains on board during the coasting trade period must be paid prevailing industry wages and, in prote and is protected under Canada's labour laws, essentially levelling the playing field. Before this policy was in place, we would routinely see seafarers on foreign flag ships paid as little as $2 an hour. The SIU of Canada continues to work closely with our government on the implementation and oversight of this policy within the regulations of the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. This policy is a clear example of how consensus to, can be reached between government, ship owners and unions while ensuring that the domestic workforce retains the right to work on board any vessel operating on its coast. The marine shipping industry in Canada is thriving. As Chair of the ITF Cabotage Task Force, Dry down in Australia, isn't it? It's a long flight, I know, but it makes you thirsty. I'm reg regularly reminded of how the Coasting Trade Act in Canada and the Jones Act in the United States are so integral to the overall success of our shipping industries and such a large, large contributor to the economies of both Canada and the United States of America. 
These policies are often regarded by our colleagues in Europe, <coughs> Africa, Asia, and Australia as the gold standard for the protection of seafarers' rights and the safety of our domestic marine industries. Not only do strong cabotage laws ensure that domestic seafarers retain their jobs, they are also tremendous catalysts of economic growth for countries with such policies in place. Many governments and companies would view such a policy as a potential hindrance to the economy, with the thought being that industries with these protections in place would make them less competitive with the international industry. In Canada, we have seen these fears diminish over time as the maritime industry is more competitive and profitable today than before these measures were put in place. The shipping industry accounts for roughly 30 billion of the Canadian economy and employs over 250,000 workers directly and indirectly. Providing opportunities for domestic seafarers to be employed on all vessels operating cabotage, regardless of registry, also means that millions of dollars in tax revenue and other deductions are reinvested into the domestic economy and into the communities where our members work and reside. Having protections that ensure Canadian seafarers are operating ships in Canadian waters also improves public perception of the maritime shipping industry, as there are fewer fears regarding the safety and security concerns that accompany the use of sometimes underqualified foreign seafarers unfamiliar with our waterways, working for pennies on the dollar. With a stable marine policy now in place, we are seeing an increase in domestic cargo being shipped throughout our country, and Canadian ship owners are investing in new tonnage and new technology with confidence in the long and short term outlook of the domestic shipping industry. Senators, with the exception of the weather in February, Australia and Canada share many things in common, and we feel strongly that this assembly and this government should examine the case for reinforcing stronger cabotage laws. Australia and its residents, the same as those in Canada, should not have to depend on foreign shipping operators to transport, import, or export any product by the marine shipping mode when there are highly qualified, good-paying jobs to be had by your seafarers here at home. It is the shared opinion of the SIU of Canada and the International Transport Workers Federation that similar cabotage laws be enforced here in Australia to ensure the protection of Australian seafarers, which would reinvigorate this once thriving industry. Complacency and an acceptance of the status quo to permit foreign vessels to operate unrestricted on the coast jeopardizes the safety and security of the Australian maritime industry and unjustly prevents Australian seafarers from getting up the gangway to work on board these ships. We have seen in Canada that the economic fears surrounding cabotage law come without evidence and come without cause, as the maritime industry is in a better position now than before we had these policies in place. We believe the same could be said for our Australian comrades. Under the same circumstances, given a chance, the Australian flag could fly again and your seafarers could be working. And if I can just close, and Chair, if you permit me. I'm permitting you, go for it. I would just like to go back, <clears throat> Senator, to your question about the butcher. Because it, it twigs something when I was appearing before my own Senate. What is the true cost? And what is the true cost we should focus on? Is it the cost to the shipping company or the cost to Australia? And this is just my opinion, and I would never tell someone what is right and what is wrong. But as politicians and as community leaders and the leaders of the country, are the people not more important than the profit sometimes? Because that's what it boils down to. And we had a case in our country where we had the new trade agreement with Europe. And, the, and you talk about farming. The farmers were very excited because they thought we can move our cargo, they said, $7 a ton. And to move that cargo on a Canadian ship is $41 a ton. From start to finish, storage to when it shipped overseas. And we went and we met with them and we talked to them. And we said, yeah, it's $7 a ton now. But when there's no Canadian fleet left, it'll be $50 a ton or 60 if they stay. Because if they get a better deal somewhere else, they'll leave and there'll be no ships left to carry that cargo. And the poor butcher, if the poor butcher charges $8.95 a kilo for his steak, do you throw the butcher out and bring in a foreign butcher who will do it for $6.95? No. But seafarers get overlooked and that's what happens. Thank you.
Thank you, Jim. And I, and I know Senator McDonald's dying to ask questions, but I'm very keen because I raised this with you in Canada last year when I said, you know, to, to do what you have done travelling the nation and meeting with stakeholders, and I did raise with you, how did you go with the, 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 the farmers? Yeah. Because you are a far larger food producing nation than we are, we, are, we are here in Australia. So I'm going to flick over to Senator McDonald because it was not a walk in the park. You didn't have President Trudeau say, how can I do everything to give your members a lot more work? You had to work hard with this and you had to do it with, with the nation and you brought them along with you. Come on, Senator McDonald. I, 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 I really want you, that's why I wanted Jim to come in first before you left because I knew you Thank would have a you, host Senator of questions. Thank you, Senator Stoll. Um, thank you very much, Mr Given. So when did the Canadian cabotage laws come into being? Is uh, this recent, is it? No, our cabotage laws have been around since probably 1921, 20, 22. I think oh. it was called the Westminster Act when it first came in, based on uh, British. And at that time, it could be a Canadian or British flagship that sailed in Canadian waters. Right. OK. No, sorry, just something you yeah. said made me think it was You've recent. You've done a lot more work to improve it, sorry. Right, OK. So without um, sparking any sort of conflict between Canada and the US, um, the, the, um, uh, Dave said that there was 40,000 US jobs and you've just said there are 250,000 direct and indirect jobs. Yeah, I think Dave said 650,000. Oh, 650, yeah. I'm sorry. I said 900, but I'm yeah. prone to exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> That's when it suits me. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, look. You know, lots of things you say resonate with me as, a, as an agricultural producer, um, and, and I do understand the argument you're making. Um, I, I think the cost one is always problematic, having had my house on the line. At the end of the day, somebody's got to pay. And, uh, you know, that's always the, you know, you're competing on an international market, we all are. And so long as your farmers can get their crops sold, at a fair price that includes your price, then happy days. Yeah, and, 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 and to address that, and when, when you look directly at the farmers, uh, you, at, uh, it's, it's not there now, but we had the Canadian Wheat Board. Mm. And the Canadian Wheat Board actually purchased two ships in order mm. that they could transport it and have a, a dedicated line to transport mm. that product. Mm. And even once they dissolved the Canadian Wheat Board, uh, they still kept the ships and they're mm. still utilized to this day. Yeah. And, and I understand when you talk about competitiveness and you talk about mm. I have to sell the product for a certain price. Mm. I understand that 100%. Mm. But I also understand that, especially farmers, because my, my wife, thank God, is from a, a family of farmers. Mm. I, we're not allowed to call them farmers. Oh. Not today. They're actually business people. <laughs> but they, they look at the cost every day. But they also look at the short, you know, it's not short term, it's long term. Mm. Because of the investments in the machinery that they have, mm. investments mm. in the crops, investment in everything, <clears throat> they have to be looking long term. Mm. And even sitting down and talking to them, it, this, $7, this $7 looks fantastic. Mm. But That's I'm going to be out of business in five or eight or ten years mm. once that cost goes above what I have a guarantee of of $41 for the next ten years. Mm. And, and you know that comes into play when you're doing any household budgets or anything else. So you do contracts, you do price contracts with your farmers that are 10 year contracts, do you? Pricing contracts, is that what you're saying? No, we, we, when we contract with the shipping companies, mm. we talk to the shipping companies and the shipping companies, of course, are dealing with the, the farmers or dealing with the uh, aggregates or dealing with the mines or dealing with anybody and they've mm. got a certain cost. So our employment contracts, we base it on that because everybody's got to get their piece of the pie because if we start kicking somebody in the butt too bad, they're not going to come back. Mm. So yeah, we, we take that all into consideration. But when we were dealing with cabotage, so cabotage in Canada was, was always there. And under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, we, we signed an agreement with uh, the European, or they negotiated one, which put a piece of cabotage, it, it put some cabotage on the table to open up to foreign carriers. Mm. And, and I'll say that it's never been utilized. Mm. And when the new government came in, they fenced that in. Mm. And then we dealt with the issue of the temporary foreign worker process. Mm. We, we, look, we look at it a little differently than the US. If we don't have a ship, you're free to bring a ship in. Mm. Any flag you want, but it has to follow Canadian law. Mm. And you have to employ Canadians. You can still keep the Cypriot flag on the back, but you're gonna employ Canadians if they're available. You're gonna pay them a Canadian wage. And if there are no Canadians available, 
You can use the foreign seafarer, but he's going to get exactly the same wage as the Canadian. He's going to pay taxes the same as the Canadian. He's going to pay into our social programs the same. Is no that difference. From when you cross international waters, or at what point does the international flagship have to change over to Canadian workforce? As soon as they apply for a coasting trade waiver and, and they run in Canada under cabotage. Right. But our cabotage is also has a very expansive uh, definition. Mm. If oil is pipelined out of Calgary, Alberta, for example, to Texas, and then loaded on a foreign flag vessel and brought back to Canada, mm. that's considered Canadian cabotage. If a vessel takes a cargo from Montreal, Quebec to Rotterdam, and then it's loaded in another vessel from Rotterdam and taken back to Canada, that whole voyage is considered cabotage. It's a very expansive definition. Thank you. I've got some questions anyway. Yeah, yeah. Think just, just jump in. But Jim, what also got me here, oh sorry, Senator you want, okay. What also got me here is too that, and I'd said to you in Canada at the time, well look, Canada's thriving, your economy hasn't collapsed, but I think one of the best, look, everything you raise is, is, is to me is music to, to our ears, especially seeing it in practice and meeting a lot of your people that rely on a strong Canadian shipping industry, domestic shipping industry. But we look at, um, um, uh, Sorry, I've just gone blank. It'll come to me. Yeah, it will come to me in a minute. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. But you've also, not only the way it works too, Senators, is that you are very active in a recruitment and training program for young Canadians as well. And, of course, the knock-on effect is just blossoming. Do you want to touch on that for us, Jim? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, of, one of the... And, and I can touch on that with the Temporary Foreign Worker Program, because one of the things built into the program is... The, and it was a concern to the unions and concern to everyone... But there's, a, there's an element built in that just because you're, we're short of a seafarer and you're using a temporary foreign worker, there still has to be an investment in training for future seafarers. And our companies invest heavily with us in training. Over the last two years, uh, we've spent over $2 million in the industry to, to attract and ret retain new seafarers mm -hmm. in order to fill these jobs that we knew were coming. So it, it is a real collaboration between government, and, there, and there's now an, a new initiative that's supported by the government that's going to be basically a clearinghouse for, for some of the jobs and for training if new people want to come in. We almost lost the skill set. I'll be very honest with you. In this 2000, is what I'm worried about here. In yeah. 2015, when we looked at what was happening, uh, I predicted our industry would be gone in six or seven years. Thankfully, cooler heads prevailed within the government, and we were able to sit down, and, and everybody saw the benefit of having a strong national Canadian fleet. Mm. And the sky hasn't fallen. The country hasn't fallen apart. People are still doing business. It's thriving. It, it hasn't killed or hurt anybody. Yeah, but I wanted to, it came back to me too where I also wanted to go. It's a very important issue you raise with us, because the, I've been running that argument, you know, with the, 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 you know our... Uh, captains and our, our uh, pilots and our uh, deck officers and you know and our seafarers, they don't just go and get their skills out of a Wheaties box. These skills are developed for many, many, many years before we get and our engineers and, and, and the like. Once we lose that that cohort, where the heck are we going to go? And that's why I raised with Dave earlier because of the the merchant navy prepares and does all the sea trials for our defence capabilities before they hand them over. But I wanted to raise with you the point. Well, I want you to, you know, I, I thank you when you raised the point of the seven dollars a ton versus the forty one dollars a ton, and that is always attractive. And we know money is like electricity; it'll take the shortest. We know that. But that is a very good point you raised, Jim, and now I've missed this in all the years too, that once we have done away with our own domestic fleet, what is the guarantee that the foreign flag vessels will continue to charge exploited tonnage rates? Yeah, There's no guarantee. You are spot on. This is something that I had completely missed. And if you, won't, if, you won't up to their, if you won't go up to their rate, they're going to go somewhere else and get $7.01 because they don't really care about you at $7. Well, but like, like you said, that could be the case once the Aussies have gone, you know, our own domestic fleet and our Australian ship owners. There is no guarantee that the foreign flag vessels don't, they're not going to pass it on to their crews, but then start upping the rates and all of a sudden, what do we do then? So how the many rating? foreign flag vessels are there? Like, is there a duopoly? Oh, now I'm going to ask, you mean running into Australia or around the world? Yeah, so basically, because the straight up answer would be would they would compete let, and well, I don't like to use that word because it's overused, but um, do you know what I mean? Like, ultimately, 
Have you, are you saying in Canada it went from seven dollars back to forty, or no? It never left forty. So, oh, sorry, left. sorry. No, we never left forty. It's an example. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh. So the ones that wanted to weaken the cabotage laws, and Jim, you jump in here, and the same ones who ex- want to exploit the temporary visa system, which is rife in Australia. It's, yeah. it's like wildfire, it's gone crazy. And the regulators all speak with forked tongues. They're full of bulldust, they don't try and find an Aussie ship, but, but they've been helped out because the Aussie ships have been sent off and then come back reflagged and all sorts of stuff. So... Yeah, in- if, if you look at investment, and, and I'll just speak to Canada, if you look at investment in tonnage, in, in 2015, there was, uh, and I'm approximating within a, a few here because I just looked at the numbers, about a, 112 applications to bring in a foreign ship. And once the policies were all in place, if you look at 2019, that's down to 80. And our own Canadian shipping companies have invested in five or six tanker vessels, three or four cement vessels, mm-hmm. bulk carriers, and they're building more. It, it's offset. So that benefit has now come back into the country. And it's confidence. Yeah, it's confidence mm-hmm. in, in the industry. And, and competition always comes up, and I know I hate to say it too, yeah. because it, we all understand competition. Everybody in this room understands competition. Mm-hmm. Nobody better than a union person knows about competition, because we're worse than the Catholic Church when it comes to fighting yeah. with each other. And, and, but that's my point. They have competition with right multiple <laughs> players. So if you've only got two or three, that's not going to be competition, because they'll just set their rates. Right, so, and I suppose that's my guess. Is there three or four big international shipping companies that really control the market, or is there a genuine like twenty or thirty different shipping companies that are genuinely competing? If you know what I mean. Yeah. Because that's yeah. that's a question. I listen, listen, it's it's one of those things. If if you do a deep dive yeah. into any of these shipping companies that are running in here with whatever flag they have and anything else, do a deep dive on them. You would not believe how profitable they are. Oh, I would. You wouldn't believe how profitable they are. And if you have an Australian flag with Australian crew running, proudly paying taxes and everything else, they're still profitable. They might not be as profitable as this crook over here who's not paying taxes, cheating his crew, laxing on safety. But they're profitable. And they're employing Australian seafarers, spending money in the local economy. The ship owner flying the flag is paying taxes back into the registry. Not to mention national pride. Yep. Where does that come in? Yeah. It's, it's the easiest thing for corporations, and I'm sorry, the easiest things for corporations and governments to do is turn their back. 